Welcome. Growing up in Athens, I remember a graffiti on a wall in my neighborhood. And the graffiti declared, stop the world I want to get off. Stop the world I want to get off. It was signed by some leftist anarchist. And I remember my then lefty pretentious self quite liking the message. Because I thought, yes, it's true, with capitalism, there is this constant change, this constant demand for us to learn more things in order to be able to keep up with technological developments, with new techniques. This was the time where my generation had to learn English because the globalization was starting to, uh, to incorporate Greece. Or at the time, we had to learn these new instruments called computers and we thought that's too complicated this skepticism towards growth this uncomfortable attitude towards the destabilizing effects of capitalism has been constant in the narrative of the left but lately we see that such skepticism toward change does not only come from the left now we see that some of the most vocal crusaders against the supposed destabilizing effects of capitalism come from the right. Whether it is about artificial intelligence, about global economic globalization, or about new technologies, many on the right make the call that there needs to be some intervention to stop this very fast change that capitalism is bringing. So the topic today of New Idea Life, of the podcast of the Ayn Rand Institute is is conservatives for stagnation. So, Elan, so who, Elan are these, who are these conservatives and what type of stagnation do they want? There are a number of them, and I think the two that come to mind we put on the thumbnail for this video, Tucker Carlson, and we'll talk more about him in a moment, and Steve Bannon, who was instrumental in Trump's getting into the White House a few years ago. There are many others, and I think we should talk about some of the more theoretical pre presentations of this perspective. One of the figures behind that is Yoram Hazoni. We'll talk about him as well. I think the important thing to get here is that there's something deeper than economics involved here. So often it's understood culturally as there's a claim about globalization. There's a claim about offshoring jobs. There's a claim about the uh, reduction in workforce in the United States, in particular sectors like manufacturing. And the responses are, let's have an industrial policy. Let's protect manufacturing jobs. And this is something you heard as well from Donald Trump. I hesitate to include him in this company because in, in many ways, it's hard to say what Trump's policy was, but there's definitely elements of this perspective in some of the rhetoric that we heard from Donald Trump. And we'll, we'll come up to that as well. The, philosophic issue here is one that goes to the heart of what does it mean to be alive? What does it mean to create values in your life? And how does one react to the constant rate of change that exists in a, in a free, semi-free capitalist society, which is what we have around us? And I think that the reactions to it and the, the positive perspective one should adopt in contrast, these are really important things that I, I, I want to explore today. Before we get into more uh, that in-depth analysis, I think it's useful to get some of these examples on the table to talk about how is this perspective presented and then tease out from it, what is this kind of stagnation that we're talking about? What does it really uh, look like? So I think let's play a short clip here from a conversation that occurred between Ben Shapiro and Tucker Carlson. And I think both of these figures are, are significant in the American conservative uh, coalition, however you think of it. Uh, and Tucker Carlson has lost his position at Fox News as the leading uh, voice, but I don't think th this is the end of Tucker Carlson. I think we'll see more of him. So I think he's still someone important to pay attention to. So let's take a, a listen to this conversation they have about driverless trucks. When the pedal hits the metal, like you, you talk in the, in the book about technology and how it's shifting and taking away jobs from folks. Yes. And you make specific reference to truck driving and the fact yes. that there are going to be these automated cars on the roads. So would you, Tucker Carlson, be in favor of restrictions on the ability of trucking companies to use this sort of technology specifically to, you know, sort of artificially maintain the number of jobs that are available in the trucking industry. Are you joking? In a no, second. I mean, in a second. In other words, if I were president, when I say to DOT, Department of Transportation, we're not letting driverless trucks on the road, period. Why? 
really simple. Driving for a living is the single most common job for high school educated men in this country, in all 50 states. By the way, that's the same group whose wages have gone down by 11% over the past 30 years. The social cost of eliminating their jobs in a 10-year span, five-year span, 30-year span, is so high that it's not sustainable. So the greater good is protecting your citizens from, look, capitalism is the best economic system I can think of, I think that anyone's ever thought of, but that doesn't mean that it's a religion and everything about it is good. No, but, but There's no I'm, Nicene Creed of capitalism that I have to buy into. What I care about is living in a country where you know decent people can live happy lives, actually. And so, no, I would say immediately, no, are you joking? And I maybe would make up some pretext for public consumption, like, oh, they're dangerous. The technology's not quite finessed. No, no. But the truth would be, I don't want to put 10 million men out of work so this, because you're going to have 10 million dead families and the cascading effect from that will wreck your country. So. There's, we can have a whole episode just on this short clip. It, it is rich with uh, points that are worth responding to. I'll just say a couple of quick things, and then I want to get to some more examples of this perspective. So notice, I can't resist saying this, but notice, it's true that capitalism is not a religion. It's better than a religion. It's, it's based on a scientific view of what human life requires and the conditions that human life politically requires for human flourishing. So in that sense, He's right. It's not a religion. It's better than that. It's something that you can ground in the nature of human beings. Uh, but let's put that aside because I think that's a straw man. I don't think I don't think either of us as advocates of capitalism would say that there, no. this is the way to think about the the, uh, the system. And and certainly this is not what we have today. We have a highly controlled economy. So let's put that aside. Notice in what he's reacting to is the primary for him is what impact will this have on a society? What, what should we do to this 10 million people that he thinks would be left without work? And notice what he's catering to. Now, whether he has this view or not, I, I'm not in a position to say, but it's clear from what he's saying that he's catering to a particular view of life. So if you're someone in this position who drives a truck and your job might be eliminated because in a few years time, we're gonna have driverless trucks that do the job better, cheaper, faster, more safely than you can, what should that attitude be? Should it be, no, I don't want them on the road and I'm going to vote for somebody who says, stop it and tells a lie in order to keep it from happening, as Tucker Carlson has suggested he would do? Or is it, well, what else can I do with my time? How else can I, maybe I could learn to help program <laughs> driverless cars. Maybe I could find a job in another industry. Maybe I can get more educated and find other opportunities to, to use my abilities in life. But that kind of perspective on it is really important. How do you think of yourself? How do you think of, are you gonna be one who thinks, well, this is the best I can do. I'm not willing to change or accept any kind of uh, innovation in, in my role. And I'm gonna stop other people from advancing. So that think about the, he's talking about cascading effects for families. And, and certainly I, I have sympathy for people who lose their jobs and that has significant impact on them economically. And, and I get that. But what about the people who are developing driverless trucks? What about the companies that need to, that, that want to implement this? And why should their step forward be blocked? And so this is part of what we're trying to get at with this conception of a claim that you have a right to stagnate. You have a right to not give up this job because somebody has come up with a, an innovation that would eliminate it. Uh, do you want to add to this? Translate, yeah. Let us translate for a moment, Elan, what he said. So what he's saying is, in simple words, I want to use force against people who have not harmed anyone, and I want them to I want to coerce them in not putting the products of their ingenuity in actual effect. This is what he's saying. He's saying, you created something that I know is good. Notice, he's not telling it's crap, he's not telling it's dangerous. He's actually winking at you. We're going to tell people it's dangerous, which means he knows it's not. So he says, I know this is something very good and I want to stop it. In the 19th century, actually, there were some people who were thinking like Tucker Carlson. They were called the Luddites. So they thought that the introduction of machinery in the factories is going to take away their jobs. They were factory workers. 
So what they did, they started vandalizing factories. Even Karl Marx himself realized how stupid and reactionary this is, and he criticized the Luddites. So Karl Marx has a better understanding of how progress works than Tucker Carlson. This is where we find ourselves in 2020, in 2023 with the conservative movement. So Tucker Carlson is saying, I want to use force to stop you from creating something because I recognize how good it is going to be. Yeah, I think that's a good way to summarize the, the political implications of it. Let, let's put a couple more examples on the table so we can have more to, to look at. Uh, another uh, famous monologue from Tucker Carlson, he's not the only example, but he, he's particularly eloquent on this. And I think it was a, a drum he was beating for a long time. So this comes from 2019, so pre-COVID, pre-concerns about uh, manufacturing jobs going uh, to China. And there's real concerns about that. We'll come to it in a minute. Uh, so this is 2019, and he and he's railing. This is from a wider context where he's railing against the perspective of Mitt Romney versus Donald Trump. And so that's the wider context. And and he's concerned. He, he's upset that Mitt Romney uh, is thinks the economy should have more uh, emphasis on finance. It's a very confused kind of precision. But here's the the passage. I'm going to read bits of it because I think it, it picks up on this same theme. Uh, that he we heard in response to the question about driverless trucks. So this is from uh, 2019. So Carlson says, quote, what kind of country do you want to live in? A fair country, a decent country, skipping a little bit, a country you might recognize when you're old. I'm going to pause there. Let me ask you, Nikos, do you want the country you live in to look recognizable when you're old? I mean, well, even if the sense, answer is yes, yeah. <laughs> in some <laughs> ways, this that, this also begs the question. So, what shall I do about it? Mm -hmm. So, what what can you do about the fact that if you want your if you, okay, here's the thing: there is there are some places where you can go and everything can be the same, almost the same they were as they were 30 years ago. My mother's village is such a place. It's in the mountains of Crete. It even has the title traditional village. So, people who go there know that odds are in 50 years more or less it's going to be the same i like going there for like five days every year it's nice but expecting that the world will stop developing because you want to live in a, in in the same quote the same country whatever that means this is something which uh, which shows that in your mind you are a mega central planner like you, your your ideal job is i want to be like a soviet commissar who will tell you how society should B. And if we think about it, how do societies change? Do they change because some people say, you know what, I want to piece off the Tucker Carsons of this world. No. Societies change because people come up with stuff that a lot of people like, a lot of people give the thumbs up to these things, and therefore these things take over. An example, a simple example would be like people in Greece don't drink any more that much Greek coffee. We drink a uh, Freddo espresso. Why? Because a lot of people decided, I prefer that. I pre this is something that I like more. And, you know, you want to drink Greek coffee, there are places you can find it. But taking this and projecting it to a whole society, this is how societies change, because people vote with their feet. And Tucker Carlson, and again, he's not somebody, he's not a random person. He's the most prominent firebrand of the American right these days. And as we will see later, he's not alone. All the intellectual leaders of what we could call the new right, the culture war right, they are all singing from the same tune, which says that we need to take the role of the central planner and we need to tell you how society should look like in 30 years. Brezhnev and other Soviet commissars couldn't tell you how society will look like in 30 years, but Tucker Carlson apparently knows and thinks he should be able to do so. Yeah, and I agree. I think that there's different ways to answer that question. Some of it is cultural, some of it is, is historical. But think just on the axis of technology. If the if you told me that the world is going to be technologically recognizable as it was when I was 15, I would be very sad because there's so many things that have happened that have saved time that are life-changing. If you think about 
mobile phones, the internet didn't exist when I was 15. There's so many things that have happened. And what he's pr playing on here, so the, the, the passage from Carlson is a country you might recognize when you're old. He's not talking about, will the houses look the same as they do now? Will we have some sort of continuity? I think what he's really getting at, and as we'll see in the rest of this quote, is that you don't have to put any effort into advancing your life. You should just be able to coast. Let me get to that. So let me continue with the quote. Back to Carlson's words. A country where you can make a solid living outside the big cities, where Lewiston, Maine, seems almost as important as the west side of Los Angeles, a country where environmentalism means getting outside and picking up the trash, skipping forward. And above all, notice the emphasis, above all, a country where normal people with an average education who grew up in no place special can get married and have kids and repeat unto the generations, end quote. I think that's the crux of what he's talking about. Traditional ways of life, unexceptional, not ambitious, no place. I was born no place special. I grew up in a not, not special family and I didn't want that. I wanted more out of life and I wasn't willing to settle for it. And what he's playing to is the kind of mentality that just wants to live in a cyclical kind of existence. Like this is what my grandparents did. It's good enough for them. I'm going to keep doing it and don't ask me to do more. And that's the mentality that he's, he's react, he's sort of fostering here. And again, I think this is really important. Let me give one more concrete from somebody else and then we'll dive into some of these, uh, bringing out some of the ideas behind this. I wanted to give someone other than Carlson and we'll get to Hazoni uh, in a minute, but I think it's important to get that whether this is sincerely held or it's rhetoric for the sake of appealing to particular constituencies, I think it, both of those are, are important you see elements of this in some of Trump's rhetoric. And so when we heard Trump threatening manufacturers in the United States, this is when he was president. So he had power and this threat was not an, an empty campaign promise. This was, he's the president. He, he can do things like this. And it's, it, it's unnerving. There was a, an incident where he said to manufacturers that if they take their uh, business beyond our borders, if they go outside or they sell their stuff outside, they will be punished. There will be imposed a 35% uh, special tax, so a punitive tax, and all for the sake of not causing American workers in particular factories and particular manufacturing jobs to lose their jobs to the, the, the companies making a decision to take that process and, and having it done overseas. That is the kind of thing that we're talking about. So it's playing to the people who, I don't want to lose my job because uh, uh, it's being taken over. And I shouldn't have to be uh, pushed in a position of having to find something else to do with myself. I demand that other people have their freedom curtailed as a result. So, so we've got a few examples here. Let me throw it back to you, Nikos, if you want to add to this. Yeah. So what I would want to say is notice here, we're not talking about some big topics, like for example, national security. So a lot of people would say, if we, if we send too many of our, if we manufacture too many important uh, products in China, then there's a national security issue. I'm not even discussing the issue of, oh, for example, if we have free immigration, my country is going to be unrecognizable. That's a, that's a different discussion. We, here, they're talking about things such as the introduction of new technologies or your right to do whatever you want with your business. So someone could say, well, this is this is not about technology. This is about you shouldn't be able to take your company and leave. But in a way, this is also a technology. This is you decide that there's a better way for me to run my business or there's a better way for me to pursue my goals. And what I want to do is uh, take my company and uh, outsource it somewhere else. And again, the central planner is telling you, no, I'm going to force you not to do it. I'm going to punish you by taking more by stealing more of your stuff, legally stealing more of your stuff, to prevent you from doing so. And someone could say here, Elan, come on, this is just you, you, picked, you found the two or three economic issues and now you're creating this uh, straw man that conservatives are like that. But here's where it gets even more serious, that this is not only an economic issue. This fear of change, this hostility to change is embedded in the philosophy, is embedded in the way these conservatives view the world. 
And I want to bring the example of what is today the most prominent, the most influential school of thought, the most influential uh, network, let's say, within the conservative movement, which is national conservatism. You might have followed the news recently. They had the conference in the UK. Everyone, anyone who is someone in the in 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 the culture wars or in the right wing universe in the UK spoke in that conference. There's a good chance that the next president of the United States is someone who is endorsed by national conservatism. If this is the Santis, Trump is not miles away from national conservatives. So let's have a look at what national conservatives say about change, how they envision change. And to take it a step further, how they envision your freedom to be able to come up with stuff that will bring change. So let's see what Hazoni, Yoram Hazoni, who is the most prominent intellectual of national conservatives, says. Again, this is important because this is how the majority of conservatives who matter think these days. So Hazoni says something which is very correct. He says, there are two ways for the conservative movement today. And these two ways have to do with what we consider as the good. The one way says, the good is what protects and maximizes the freedom of the individual. That's one vision of the good. The other vision of the good is that the good is what protects and what maintains the traditions, the values, and what conserves the institutions and the way of life that made this country what it is today. And also, they say, notice that there's a dichotomy between these two roads, the road of freedom, of individual freedom, and the road of conserving our traditions. Why? Because they say, and again, they're correct, individual freedom can upset tradition and the established ways. For example, I move my factory to Thailand. I upset in the short term, but I do upset my local community. The factory is not anymore there. Or I bring a new technology. I do upset. I do rock the boat. And Hazoni and National Conservatives say, the way forward for conservatives is to recognize that the good is not that which promotes individual freedom. So let's get rid of this misunderstanding that conservatism is a fellow traveler with what we would call classical liberalism. The good for the conservative is what is good for maintaining tradition, is what is good for maintaining the things as they used to be, the values, the institutions, the way of life as it was in the past. And you will notice also that they talk about the rights of uh, older people. And as you hinted earlier, the right to have the same country with the same jobs, ways of life, traditions that the country was used to be. And as you understand, this means freedom goes out of the window. Because freedom means I might come up with things that will change this country. Bill Gates changed this country. Steve Jobs changed the country. Jeff Bezos changed the country. So national conservatives, again, the most prominent intellectual movement these days in conservatives, is saying these individuals are dangerous. Their freedom is dangerous. So on the most basic level, they say freedom bad, tradition good. It's important to, to let me underline something you said. So tradition can be good and can be bad. And it's so that we have good traditions. And I, you can think of the American political tradition as something that originated here. We've had it for 250 almost years. The idea of individualism as the bedrock of a free society. You could talk about that as a tradition, and I think that's valid. That's not the same as the way they are thinking of tradition. I think they're, they're taking it as this was handed down to us from people in the past, and we're going to take it over. We're not going to question it. We're not going to evaluate it. It's just it gains a certain standing in their mind because it's old, not because it's good, which is the way I think of the American political tradition. So traditions are good or bad, and you have to evaluate them. The mis a, a fundamental mistake is just to take them over unquestioningly, which is, I think, what's happening here is it's, and regarding its age and its, its longstanding acceptance as evidence of its being good, which is, I think, the way this is understood. 
Uh, and I think there's something interesting to say we should come back to about the the view that you're pointing out here. That the implication here is that the the biggest innovators in the last 25 year, years and more, Bill Gates, Steve Jobs, Bezos, and not, they're not the only ones, but they're really well known. This implies something about them that they're a problem. They don't have a place in this society. They should be curtailed. They should be hemmed in. And I think there's something deeply wrong about that philosophically. Uh, and they, I think it ties in with this view that stagnation is something that some people are entitled to as a status, that they should not be demanded, uh, nothing more should be demanded of them. But let's let's talk a bit more about the ideas here. So you've talked about Yoram Hazoni. I've, I've read some of his work and I follow him. Uh, let's talk a bit more about some of the other figures. So we talked about Carlson, who's more of a media figure and, and Trump's more political figure. Um, one of Trump's advisors for a long time, and I think he's he's more in the in the background now, is Steve Bannon. But I think Steve Bannon is someone you, you've been working on a project regarding Steve Bannon. I think it's important to look at him as well because it's not like he's gone away. I think he still has influence within the conservative movement. I'm interested to hear a bit from your perspective because I've always thought of him as he's described himself as an as an economic nationalist, and to me that's that's a signal that. This isn't about freedom. This is not about capitalism. There's something over and above these that you're trying to impose if you're an economic nationalist. And I think that th this is definitely something worrisome about him. So tell, tell us a bit about what you think is coming out of Bannon's view and how does it relate to this? So in some way, Bannon is the guy who made sure that Trump got in the White House. He got on board the Trump campaign three months before the elections and it, it was a very significant point for, for the elections. And Bannon, as opposed to Trump, Bannon is a political being. He's someone who sleeps and wakes up trying to think, how can my ideas win in the battle of ideas? He was a, a student, let's say, of Andrew Breitbart, and he lives by the, by the motto that says, politics is downstream from culture. So he wants his ideas to win in the, in the field of the battle of ideas. So what are his ideas? You mentioned he's an economic nationalist, but it goes deeper than that. He's not just someone who has views about trade. Bannon is a self-declared traditionalist. Traditionalist. So what is the school of traditionalism? Traditionalism says that the main theme, the main motto of modernity, which is that by using our reason, and through progress, through technology, through science, we are making the world a better place. Traditionalism says this understanding of our recent history of the last 200 years needs to be forgotten. Traditionalism says that reason and modernity and enlightenment not only did not make the world a better place, but actually have thrown us in a very dark period of history because in the place of the old values, in the place of spirituality, in the place of the ethics of the warrior. Now we have the ethics of the merchant. We only have what they call, quote, materialism. We only care about stuff. We don't anymore care about the big ideas and the big visions. So this point of view, and a point of view that, again, Bannon proudly says, I'm a traditionalist. I'm in the tradition of figures like uh, René Guénon, Julius Evola, Alexander Dugin, who Bannon, the, the Russian uh, ultra-nationalist, I don't even know how to characterize him, that Bannon proudly says, I like his work a lot. So these people are actually telling us that progress is in itself bad. So the problem is not driverless cars or artificial intelligence. The, prog the problem is with progress itself. And the problem is with elevating reason as something which is to be admired. No, they say, reason, is, and reason and freedom is not to be admired. What is to be admired are the old values, again, like the values of uh, the sage, the values of the warrior. So people like Bannon, who again, they're very influential in today's rights, they have a view regarding progress, which is way, way darker than just saying, oh, we want to protect the American producer, or we just want to protect uh, uh, from competition from China. So, Nikos, I think let's 
turn to the question of how does this approach, how to name this approach and why, why did we call this episode conservatives for stagnation? What is the stagnation involved here? What's the, what's the positive contrast to think about here? One piece of context that I think is, is useful to draw out from the conversation so far, it's a thread that we've been both uh, talking about. One distinguishing feature of capitalism is that it, it enables and fosters and celebrates innovation and progress. It's, it's both an engine of progress and it's fueled by it. So the more you, so if you think about uh, major companies in the last 50 years, the more wealth that's being created through technology, that's fed new startups, that's fed new investments, and that has fed new innovations in various fields. And that's a good cycle. It's a virtuous circle to the extent certain areas of the economy are free. So it's, it's a hallmark of, of a free society of capitalism in particular, that it, it, it goes along with and it's dynamic. It's not static. It's not bound to traditions. It's, it's, it encourages the most innovative to come and it rewards those who are able to meet a market demand and serve people something new and valuable. So it's the farthest thing from a tradition bound approach. And, and I think this goes to the point you were developing just now with Dugan and others, which is their whole outlook on life is we don't want that hit the brakes. We don't want innovation. We don't want them. What fuels that, which is, as you were saying, it's, it's reason and science and the, the will to, to try new things and the, the willingness to try them. So I think that's an important piece of context for thinking about the positive here. So I, I want to take some of these examples we, we hinted at at the beginning and ask this question. So if, if part of the claim we're making is there are figures who are pushing this idea of stagnation on the, within the conservative movement, there are people who are catering to an audience that wants it. Well, what does it look like to not have that perspective? And what is the meaning of the, the desire for stagnation? So there's, so there's a fork in the road here. So let's take a couple of examples and think through what would you do? What would it be a reasonable reaction to have versus this perspective of, oh, I just want to be here. I don't want to have to change. Let's stick to the familiar. I don't want uh, to have to find another kind of way of uh, being employed. So let's take something. Uh, we were talking about this before we went live. And, and I give the example of the coming into the economy of Windows and, and the Mac as just the, the easy to use computers and how it revolutionized the office space. So I learned to type on a typewriter. <laughs> so that's how long ago it was. And that wasn't so, soon after it was personal computers became widespread because of the innovations we saw in Silicon Valley and Bill Gates's mission to put a computer on every desk. And what happened in the workplace is if you didn't know how to type, there was a typing pool. And then when the computers came along, it's, well, why can't you type it yourself? Learn to touch type. And a lot of people whose work was involved in typing, some in specialized cases, they were still kept on, but they, they worked on computers, not typewriters. And their, their ability to produce increased many times. Well, I can tell you, it's way more productive to work on Word or Google Doc and print things uh, than it is to type them and have to. So that's just an unimaginable leap forward. It's a small one. We take it for granted. I mean, there are people alive today who don't know the contrast, but just put yourself in the position of your source of income is being a typist. And the office is adopting Windows and Word and it's, it's all digital. What do you do? And is your attitude, no, I'm going to fight this. I'm going to protest. I'm going to, I'm going to find politicians who are going to scream this from the top of their lungs and, and put roadblocks in the way of the advance of uh, uh, the office technology so that I don't have to learn anything more. I can, I, I learned how to type. I don't need to do any more work in life. That's it. I just want to be able to keep doing what I'm doing, which is the kind of view you're hearing Carlson talk about with respect to people who are truck, truck drivers and, and the driverless trucks. We'll take another example. Um, well, or no, before we get to another example, what would be a positive perspective on that? And I think that there are so many things you could say here, but the, the natural one, I think, the contrasting one is, okay, well, maybe I can learn to use Windows and, and become skilled at using Microsoft Word and all the other programs that come along with it. I'm going to have the potential to earn more money than typing, and I, I, maybe I could learn other software and I could get a better job, or maybe I leave this job and find something else to do completely different from what I used to do. So there's, there's a whole range of options open to you. But what 
is in common to all of them. The theme behind them is not, let me hit the brakes and stop and, and penalize the people who want to progress. The theme is instead, okay, well, let me embrace this change. Let me figure out a way forward that meets my goals, that I can find new things to do, that helps me, that I will grow as a result. Because almost certainly whatever you, you do that's an innovation over typing will be something that you have to gain new skills. And even if you go to another profession, you'll need new skills. So it, it's, it's a growth orientation, a value pursuit orientation. And it's a fundamental perspective on life. It's a, it's a perspective that says, life is about motion and if you're if you're not moving forward you're stagnating and that's not good for you it's not good for any organism it's particularly not good for human beings because we are so complex and we need this kind of development i was going to give another example which we maybe we can touch on briefly but i think it's the same kind of thing but it might be more vivid uh so here's my phone i know you have one of these too i take a lot of photographs on my phone and I, it's, it's a challenge to explain to my teenagers that in 20 years ago, when you took a photograph, you had to take a piece of film out of a camera, take it to a shop, have it developed, and the people behind the counter had to have the skills to do it before that was automated. And then it went off to a factory where they processed it and they came back and then you got prints, not images on the screen. That was a, that was a big thing. That's all gone away. That's a whole industry that is now at best a niche need like you could get film and you can get it processed but it's not the way it used to be where millions of dollars were spent on this and again the same thing applies do you tell everyone else who wants a digital camera who wants to be able to take pictures on their phone you can't do that because i'm going to lose my job and i want to be able to stay processing photos for the rest of my life how dare you challenge me to grow or are you going to do something different with yourself with your life maybe you find a, a something to do with photography, but that doesn't require staying in that position. We can multiply examples endlessly, but I, I just want to take some actual cases where we've seen this happen and there's disruption and people are, I, I can understand if they're upset because there's no more work for them in an industry that's vanished. What happens with them? What is the perspective they should take? And I think that the healthy perspective is to think about this is an opportunity for growth. What else can I do? How can I learn? Can I seize on this and do something more with my life? And, and at the to... end of the day is, is also the question, does anyone have the, the moral and the political right to say to someone, stop? Because it, it's, I mean, it's, a, it's an overused example, but it, it just came to my head. This sounds a bit to me like back in the day, someone saying to Galileo, you are not allowed to see the world in a different way and act on your judgment. Saying, so oh, you came with this great uh, invention, lock it in your basement. You're not allowed to use it because other people might be, uh, other people might be uh, uh, impacted by it. And let's ask ourselves, quite often we, in the objectivist uh, community, we talk a lot about the, the role that morality plays and philosophy plays. Let's ask ourselves, would anyone have the moral standing to say you're not you shouldn't take this to the market because people will be affected if it weren't for the morality which says it's okay for you to sacrifice for others that this quote common good whatever that means is above your your good so the 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 ground where tackle carson stands to become this wannabe central planner is on the first, this idea that it's okay to use force to impose your vision about how society would look like, and one level before that, the morality that says that, no, you should sacrifice for others, and yes, you should suffer by the fact that you created something great, and actually everyone recognizes it's great, and just because it's great, you should lock it in your basement, because otherwise it will affect, uh, uh, it will affect some people. So as usual, with bad politics, we take a step, a step before them and we see bad ideas that have their basis in morality. So quite often when we talk about philosophy and morality, there's a reason we do so. They play a big, big, big role in the world that we live in. I, I agree with that. I, I want to make the point even stronger, perhaps, and put it this way. So. In philosophy, sometimes what happens is you take a, a thought experiment, you, you kind of create a stylized situation to isolate something fundamental or something salient at least. 
well, let's let me put you in a plane that crashes on an island, Nikos. And your this is the this the basic premise of the movie Castaway. You might know it with, with Tom Hanks. You're left on the desert island. You survive. You're the only survivor. And for the first week, you figure out there's fish in this stream along in the island. It's a desert island, and you're able to fish and you're able to eat. But then you can't find any more fish. But then you have to figure out what am I going to do to eat? Okay, well, <laughs> I demand more fish in the in the stream. Reality doesn't care. You can't do that. There's you don't have control over reality. So then you have to figure out. Well, maybe I can gain this. Maybe I can create a a bow and arrow and shoot some birds out of the trees and and cook them and eat them. Uh, or maybe I can create traps that are even more sophisticated and and get game and I can eat for a week on one day's labor. Wherever you are, like again, the point of this is independent of other people in reality you can't stay stagnant you you can't you, there's always things that change and that you have to adapt to them and have a new approach that requires new thinking and new knowledge and new conceptualization or what happens there are no fish you stamp your feet at the reality and you starve right if your attitude if your attitude really is like the people who say i don't want to have to leave my job processing film and I demand the reality catered to me. The only reason that works is that there, there are governments that intervene, violate the rights of other people, and make it possible for these people to stagnate, versus in nature, you would suffer the consequences immediately. So it's a fundamental need of human life to be continually growing, gaining new knowledge, gaining new skills. And I want to tie this to a couple of things that are really distinctive about Ayn Rand's conception of life and her conception of rebellions against this. So core to Ayn Rand's view of life is that the three cardinal values in life that are crucial for successful being and, and, and happiness, ultimately, reason, purpose, and self-esteem. That's not the topic of today's uh, discussion, but I want to draw on one of those, which is reason is about getting knowledge and using your mind to the full capacity, but that is instrumental to gaining self-esteem. The the conception of yourself as capable of achieving values and worthy of achieving values. And one crucial thing about self-esteem, and this ties in with this idea of growth in the face of innovation and change, is that self-esteem, like anything that you do in life that, pursue, that involves pursuit of value, is not a stack, static thing. It's like, I, I've gained it, I checked the box, it's set for life. It's not like that. It's a value. It needs to be con continually gained and kept and maintained and the same is true of your career and your pursuit of values in every field. It, it would be really destructive of one's character and one's soul to say, I've learned everything I need to learn. This is what I'm going to do for the rest of my life. And I'm just going to keep cranking the wheel. And whether you're an academic, whether you're an engineer, good luck to you. I don't think you're going to succeed. I don't think your life's going to be very good. People do that, but it's not good for them. I think this is an important perspective on life. Life is growth. Life is value pursuit. And it's, it's an ambitious perspective on life. It doesn't mean everyone needs to follow the path of Bill Gates or Steve Jobs. That's not the point. The point is to pursue life with maximum pursuit of the, sort of the maximizing your goals, whatever they are, uh, and, and within the scope of your abilities. So whether you're working in a job that's about to be eliminated or in a job that's growing because you're in a new industry like AI, good for you, grow, see what you can uh, do with that. And this is in contrast with what we've been talking about as this right to stagnate. Now, and I, I mean, keep, keep talking about as the right to stagnate. And I'm echoing the formulation from an essay in The Virtue of Selfishness the divine right of stagnation. This is uh, this was written by Nathaniel Brandon, who was one of Ayn Rand's associates at the time, and she included his essay in her book. And I, and I take that to mean that she agreed with it, and I, I imagine she had quite a hand in developing it because it flows out of her conception of what is distinctive about human life, which is about pursuit of values and continual growth. The other point I wanted to draw out here, just one further thought, and you've already alluded to this in a number of uh, of your comments, which is. This perspective implies a really unhealthy, indeed, in some cases, immoral view of innovators and the people, whether they're the originators of the innovation or they're the implementers of it, they're the, the ones who are coming in to implement the driverless trucks or the ones who are designing it and, and doing all that. 
this right to stagnation mentality flows into a resentment of the people who are doing new things and innovating and pushing you to think about the world differently, to find new ways to create value, to find a different path in your career, precisely because they're changing things. And this is the dynamism of, this is the beauty and the dynamism of a free market. So the more that you see people adopting this right to stagnation mentality, the more you get, or it goes along with, it's concomitant with the resentment against the people who are doing good. So it's an, this is goes to Ayn Rand's view of envy, which is a really uh, distinctive conception of envy as a hatred of the good for being the good. So the dislike of the, of the innovators precisely because they're doing something good. And that is a really destructive mental set. And part of what I wanted to talk about this topic today and how it's arising from the conservative movement, one reason for that is the kind of rhetoric we're hearing from Tucker Carlson and from Bannon and from other people, it's feeding that mentality. It's encouraging that mentality. And that is really destructive. And uh, I think it's long-term, it's, it's bad for the people who are succumbing to it. It's even bad, it's even worse for the rest of us who have to live with this and, and seeing roadblocks put in the path of people who want to walk down new paths. And you mentioned Ayn Rand and uh, her most famous novel, Atlas Rugged, you can see a dramatization, a, concre a, a concrete example in fiction of how this disdain for the innovators look like. So pa particularly there is a scene, I'm not going to give any spoilers, but there's a scene in part two of the book where there is a factory leaving to going, I think, to Colorado, which was a state that had relative economic freedom and many factories were moving there. And you have a dialogue between a, a businessman who is the spirit of Tucker Carlson, who is someone who says, why do we constantly have to compete with these innovators and, and an ambitious worker who is listening to him and is thinking like, okay, this guy, uh, like, the, the, you know, we are, we are from different, we are from different worlds. And go and those of you who have read the book, go and reread that scene at some point in, in part two. I think the worker, it's not a spoiler, it's a Owen Kellogg. And it's, a, it, it's, it's the two words colliding. The, the person with the self-esteem who says, I want to go where the innovators are, where the exciting things are happening, where I will develop, where I'll be my best self. And on the other hand, the guy who says, well, why do I have to, why do we have to be on our toes? Can we just pause and take a breath? And then indeed, towards the climax of the book, no spoilers, the powers to be come together and decide, yes, let's make sure that we pass a law that society will take a collective breath that we will pause the things as they are now see what happens then in the book and uh, again you have a very good dramatization of the things that we are discussing today shall i shall we read some of the super chats or do you have something else uh, before we go to the super chats and before we get to the to the parting thoughts I want to say one quick thought here, just to offer people a lead on how to think, if they want to understand this more, because we're not going to be able to cover everything there is to say about this mentality, this idea of a claim to a right to stagnate. I just want to offer one more lead, which is that I, I've mentioned that it, this integrates with Rand's conception of envy and how it feeds into it and is concomitant with it. Another thread here is Rand's analysis of what she calls the anti-conceptual mentality, which is a really profound analysis. You can find this in The Missing Link, uh, which we'll, we'll, we'll offer a link to that uh, in the show notes. And uh, it's an essay in Philosophy Who Needs It. What you see in that essay is Rand's analysis of a certain kind of mindset that is resistant to new knowledge, resistant to having to put in effort to learn more about the world. And I mention this because I think this is a prevalent mindset today, and it feeds today's growing tribalism. So tribal, one perspective on tribalism is that people gravitate to groups and collective precisely because of this re reluctance to exert the effort to think about the world themselves, to figure it out. And the tribe gives them ready-made answers, not good ones, but ready-made answers and, and an identity, which they don't have to earn. They just get from being a part of the group. And I think this is, it's another aspect of this that I think is important to understand. 
And again, it's, it's another feature of today's conservative movement, particularly the national conservatives that you mentioned earlier. I think they're feeding a, a, a strain of tribalism today. Uh, so I wanted to offer that as just food for thought for people without getting into that. Why don't we do some of the questions? And then I think it would be useful to just to mention a couple of things in parting, as you suggested. Okay, so let me say a big thank you to our friend called Adherent of Lady Columbia to Super Chat. So you, so our friend poses an important issue. So he mentioned that he follows some groups online by a guy called Carl Benjamin, and he says that the young members of this group are angry because they see the past happier forming families early and easier, that they could work more rewarding and that there was something more like a community and people felt less isolated. And then he tells that a lot of these people think that the problem today is that we live in materialism and atomized individualism. So let me let me say something about the issue of people forming. It was easier to form families. Now, I agree with that. And this is a big, big, big issue. Like the previous generation, at least in Greece, it was easy to find to buy a house. It was easy to form a family and then have your own house. But let's ask ourselves, why is it so difficult today to buy a house or to build a house? Why is it so difficult today to start a family and with two salaries or even with one salary support a family? So the problem is definitely not, the problem is not, quote, uh, neoliberalism or uh, capitalism. Actually, it's the opposite. Why is it so expensive to build a house? Because of the myriads of planning regulations, the myriads of environmental regulations, the bureaucracy. Why is it so difficult for people these days to live with a salary? Because we have to pay so much money in uh, taxation, energy is so expensive with reasons that have nothing to do with energy itself, but they have a lot to do with our energy policies. Or why do young people have debt from their studies? Because the state is so much engaged in education that the prices have been skyrocketing. So all these questions are very important and very legitimate. But the problem is not that we are, quote, automized. Actually, you could say that technology makes, makes it easier for people to form meaningful relationships. It's up to us what will be the quality of relationships we build. So these are real problems, but the solution is not more controls, as Tucker Carlson would want us to, uh, to, to believe. I just want to add one quick thing to that. I'm skeptical whenever someone uses the term atomized individualism or atomic individual. I don't think that's a valid way of thinking about how individuals are. And I think if you if your concern is that life, there's more friction today, it's harder to make friends or it's hard to connect with people despite technology making it easier for, to be in touch with people all the time. If you have a concern, I think there's something to that. I think one of the things that makes it harder and creates more animosity among people is precisely the kind of attitude that we've been talking about, which is to say, you want to open a shop that replaces a, another business and you can't do it. And there's, there's hatred of you for, for wanting to do something new and different. Well, is there a recipe for creating more friction between people but, than saying, the guy who makes buggies doesn't want the car factory opening up here because it's a competition to him. Like, it's a fantastical example, but isn't that really what we're talking about when we say we're going to stop all driverless cars because there are people who they can't get another job and we don't want the, their families collapsing. What does that mean other than, okay, we're going to pit people against each other. The people who are trying to create new things and, and push the boundaries forward versus the people who want to sit back and, in effect, stagnate. And to me, that is a real source of uh, problems inside. And it, it creates a society where you, there is resentment against the new and the daring. And that's the worst thing you can have, whether it's among a friend group or on a, on a culture-wide scale. Yeah, the success um, of someone uh -huh. is, a threat, uh, is a threat to you. But can I also read one more super chat because it, yeah. it deals with one of my favorite TV series, The Office. So our friend Sosbot with a general super chat, thank you very much. So he says, Pam, the receptionist in The Office, repeatedly sent away a salesman 
who was trying to sell Dunder Mifflin a device that would do 95% of the receptionist job. I think this is, joking aside, this is very, very insightful. So Dunder Mifflin was a horribly run company and time and again was about to get bankrupt. And Pam is a very interesting character. Pam is very timid. Pam has very low self-esteem. It takes, I don't know how many seasons to get rid of a boyfriend she doesn't like. So notice that there's a parallel between Pam's being afraid that, oh, the machines are going to do my job with also Pam not being able to take steps in her life. She wants to be a saleswoman. Later, she wants to become an artist and she doesn't take these steps till it's, till she doesn't take them soon enough. Why? Because of her lack of self-esteem. So no surprise, uh, as our friend Riley says, that she wanted to make sure that she would block a device that would do, that would do a lot of her job. Yeah, I, I mean, just to broaden this, this is going to happen more and more with the rolling out of AI. AI is just cutting edge technology that's becoming more consumer oriented. It's breathtaking. And a lot of industries are going to be disrupted that up until now, many people in those industries, there was no way to do their jobs. I mean, there are going to be many jobs in, in things like supporting lawyers. I, I mean, whether assistants, whether paralegals, there are a lot of those jobs that are either going to be more automated and so require fewer people or completely automated because you can create a really sophisticated AI algorithm for it. And those are, those are significant jobs. And those people are going to have to face the same kind of issue are they going to demand that there be a halt so that nobody can bring AI into the legal sphere or even academia or in, in education where you can find innovations like tutoring students and so on? Or are they going to say, well, I'm going to have to find something to do and grow and find a new path in life. And again, it's not for us to prescribe what that looks for someone, but the idea is you have to either seize the opportunity to grow or you push back. And I think the pushing back is the thing that we're criticizing. So, and I think your point about self-esteem is really important. And I just want to flag that for people to think about. Part of what makes this perspective appealing and why it's horrible for people like Tucker Carlson and Trump to pander to it, and I think pander is the right word, is that it's pandering to something low and, and um, it's, a, it's pandering to a lack in people. And it's a lack of confidence in their own abilities. And rather than telling people, You've got to live with that. It's better if people are oriented to, okay, I, I don't feel I can do it, but maybe I should try versus being told it's okay to be where you are and, and you, can, you can settle for what you have so far. And, and, and you gave the example of Pam. I don't remember the office very well, but I remember that that was a feature that in, in how much better would someone's life be if they seized the reins of their life and try to gain self-esteem if they don't have it. And then the, their ability to cope with life, not cope, but actually navigate life actively, so much better than, than otherwise. Parting words? Yeah, let's do that. I, I thought, I, I don't know if we wanna spend a lot of time on this, but one of the points I wanted to raise is more cultural, sociological, and it's just to observe something about where conservatism is today. Conservatism has always been a big coalition of different factions. So it, it's not surprising to me that now one particular faction or several factions are, are pushing in a certain direction. That's not new. What I think is new is that for most of my experience, observing conservatism and listening to people in this movement, mm -hmm. I've always thought of them as associated with self-reliance, with the idea that you, there's a famous quote uh, from a British politician many years ago who, who was complaining that people were rioting when they were made redundant, left, lost their jobs. And he said when his father was lost his job, he didn't just riot, he got on his bike and he looked for work and he didn't stop until he found it. And leaving aside how the, I mean, he walked that back, but that just became a kind of meme throughout the 1980s in the UK. And it was epitomizing a particular view of life. And I think that this is much more fully expressed in the American spirit, which is you lift yourself up by your bootstraps, you find new work, this doesn't work out, you move on, you go to someplace else and you move around. The whole America is different in, than Europe in that people are much more mobile and they're willing to go to new jobs. 
that was what conservatism had as a reputation. Like it was the home for people who valued those things. And those are good things. It isn't a home for that anymore. I think it's, it's a minority of conservatives who still understand that and value it, meaning leaders of the movement, not people who identify that way. And I, I find that troubling because I think conservatism is, is morphing into something very different and, and worrisome. So if, it's, if this is what's coming to define it, this whole perspective on stagnation, this opposition to progress, this is not at all something to welcome. Uh, so the, the, just an observation, uh, and I know you're familiar with that quote I was mentioning, but um, do you have any thoughts you want to leave us with? Yeah, that uh, conservatives more and more adopt the bad elements of uh, of the left. But also, I want uh, I would want to suggest to our friends as a parting words a thought experiment. What would have happened if the Tucker Carlson's of this world had their way in the 19th century when they wanted to destroy the machines from the factory? When if they had their way, when there was this. Uh, risk what will happen with the 75 percent of people who work as farmers when the agricultural revolution takes over or what would happen to the people who were uh, who were coach uh, drivers with uh, the, the coaches with horses when the automobile was introduced i would say thank god or whatever you believe in that the tucker carlson's of this world didn't have their way back then and today we live in a world where we live longer and we can be more creative more productive and at the end of the day productive doesn't mean uh, oh i want to create new stuff to disrupt no it means i want to follow my dreams i want to follow my goals i want to follow the vision that i have about what i want to do with my life and how i want to change this world great thanks nico should we uh, just give people some resources and they can explore yep. those So you mentioned the essay, The Age of Envy by Ayn Rand. There's also the essay, The Missing Link, which calls, which talks about what you call the anti-conceptual mentality and the divine rights of stagnation by Nathaniel Branden. And of course, I would also suggest Atlas Ragged, again, dramatizes what happens when a society tells to the innovators uh, step aside. Now, next week, our topic is the the if the vice of intellectual humility so quite often we say well you know be humble uh, what can i know we will actually uh, interrogate this idea now for any questions you have or for any suggestions for future episodes for topics for future episodes or if you have questions for the episodes that take place periodically which are q a episodes you can ask philosophical questions on objectivism or on any other topic please drop us an email at newideal.einrand sorry at einrand.org we read all your emails and if it's a good suggestion we will take it on board and also if you enjoyed this uh, episode like share follow us on uh, social media subscribe on youtube we read your comments on uh, at be below the videos. Quite often, I I engage, and some interesting dialogues take place. So, for the end, I will say many thanks for watching, many thanks for contributing, and many thanks to Elan. He's the one who came up with the topic, and it was an interesting discussion. So, thank you, Elan, and thank you, everyone. <laughs>